Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. Today, we're going to be continuing to read from the book, The President's Stuck in the Bathtub, Poems About the Presidents by Susan Katz. This book gives us a lighthearted poem about each past president and some fun facts for each as well. I've chosen a few presidential favorites and a few that we tend to pass over. So last week, we talked briefly about the general job description and the requirements one must have to be the president. This week, let's talk for a few minutes about how the president is elected. The president is elected through a process called the Electoral College, which is set forth by the Constitution. The Electoral College has 538 electors, and 270 are needed to become the president. Each state and the District of Columbia has electors. And most states have a win or take all policy of the electors. So for example, if the popular vote of the state, meaning the majority of the people who are able to vote in that state select one candidate, all of the electors from that state are put in that candidate's win column. New York has 29 electors, which is the third largest amount behind California and Texas. So as votes from each state tend to lean toward the majority of one candidate or another, the electors in each state are tallied, and the candidate who reaches 270 is elected our president. So now, on to the poetry. If there was a pandemic in the late 1800s or a major snowstorm at that time, families who were stuck in their homes together would sit around the fire and read poems just like these aloud. And so as I read you these poems, you can imagine families in East Hampton doing just that during this time period as well. So first up for today is John Adams. Quote, May none but honest and wise men ever rule under this root. Nickname, Atlas of Independence. And fun fact, the first president to ever live in the White House. John Adams served as president from 1797 to 1801, and this poem is called His Majesty the President. John Adams thought president should be graced by the title His Majesty. The senators thought this title too fancy, and for a democracy, rather chancy. But Adams wouldn't stop talking about it, no matter how much the Senate might doubt it. One senator, tired of hearing him drone, gave Adams a title of his own, his rotundity, for Adams was plump, amply padded from stomach to rump. Though Adams bewailed this embarrassing fate, at least his new title carried some weight. So the mocking title given to John Adams by Senator Ralph Izzard must be the first instance of mudslinging in American politics. So what is mudslinging? It's the use of insults and accusations, especially unjust ones, with the aim of damaging the reputation of an opponent. Although it was during George Washington's tenure that Adams argued in favor of his title, His Majesty the President, Adams' opponents still called him his rotundity during his own term in office. Okay, next up for today, Martin Van Buren. Quote, the less government interferes with private pursuits, the better for the general prosperity. His nickname was the Little Magician, and fun fact, he was the first president born as an American citizen. And Martin Van Buren served as president from 1837 to 1841, and this poem is called The President's Okay. Martin Van Buren, Martin Van Buren, the name was too long for crowds to cheer. So they gave him a nickname, the little magician, the little magician, but that was longer still, oh dear. So they gave him another, old kinderhook, old kinderhook, but that didn't make much of a buzz. So they shortened it, okay, okay, and indeed it was. So Martin Van Buren's nickname, the little magician, referred to his political cleverness. An old kinderhook, soon abbreviated OK, was a reference to his home in Kinderhook, New York. No one's sure where the word OK meaning fine originated. Some people say it was derived from oil correct, O-I-L-K-O-R-R-E-C-T, which was rumored to be Andrew Jackson's spelling of all correct. But Martin Van Buren gets credit for making the word popular. Next up, Zachary Taylor. Quote, I've always done my duty. I'm ready to die. My only regret is for the friends I leave behind me. His nickname was Old Rough and Ready because of his military success in the Second Seminole War, or the Florida War, from 1835 to 1842, which was held between various, various groups of Native Americans and the United States. And this war was one of the most costly to the Native Americans. 
Fun fact about Taylor, he was the first president ever previously elected to a public office. Zachary Taylor served as president from 1849 to 1850, and this poem is called Overdue Mail. The Whigs have nominated you for president, the letter sent to Zachary Taylor said, but the Whigs mailed it postage too. Taylor didn't want to spend 10 cents, so he refused that mail, dispatched it back to the dead letter office, and there it sat. After waiting for quite some time, the Whigs decided to invest a dime for a second letter postage paid, and that worked better. Taylor happily agreed and led the Whigs to victory, the only man in either camp who won the presidency by a stamp. In Zachary Taylor's time, sending mail with the postage unpaid was a common practice, but Taylor had received so many postage due letters that he refused to accept any more of them. Most sources say it took several weeks for the Whigs to realize what had happened, and when they sent him a second prepaid notification letter, he accepted immediately. Next up for today is Franklin Pierce. Quote, I wish I could indulge higher hope for the future of our country, but the aspect of any vision is fearfully dark and I cannot make it otherwise. Nickname Young Hickory of the Granite Hills, and fun fact, he was the first president who delivered his inaugural speech from memory. Franklin Pierce served as president from 1853 to 1857, and this poem is called A Christmas Tree. President Pierce trimmed the first White House tree for Sunday school children who viewed it with glee. This holiday gesture won Pierce much applause and perhaps a vote from Santa Claus. So Franklin Pierce was the first president to decorate a Christmas tree in the White House. The Christmas tree lighting ceremony on the White House lawn, a tradition that still continues, began in 1923 under President Calvin Coolidge. In 1954, President Dwight D. Eisenhower added a pathway of peace with 56 smaller trees representing the 50 states, five territories, and the District of Columbia. Today, all 57 trees are lit each evening during the last three weeks of December. Okay, next up is Rutherford B. Hayes. Quote, he serves his party best who serves his country best. Nickname the Dark Horse President, which means that his party nominated him and they didn't really know how well he was going to perform. And fun fact, first president to visit the West Coast. And Rutherford B. Hayes served as president from 1877 to 1881, and this poem is called The Presidents on the Phone. Rutherford B. Hayes got a telephone before almost anyone, so everyone in Washington could remember his phone number, one. With his telephone, Rutherford B. Hayes truly shone, for none could deny he won the right to say that he was the one and only number one. When Rutherford B. Hayes had the first telephone installed in the White House, the invention was so new that there were almost no other phones in Washington. A phone line was set up connecting the White House to the Treasury Department, but when a quartet of Hayes' friends sang a song over this line, one of them hit a high C and shattered the telephone's sounding board. Next up for today is Theodore Roosevelt, quote, speak softly and carry a big stick. Nickname Teddy, and fun fact, first president to ride in an automobile, submerge in a submarine, and fly in an airplane. And Theodore Roosevelt served as president from 1901 to 1909, and this poem is called The White House Gang. A member of the White House gang, started by Quentin Roosevelt, had to be brave enough to swallow ooey gooey fish eyes or chew a three inch worm for the world's longest minute blindfolded so he couldn't tell if it was only tapioca or spaghetti. A member of the White House gang might get the hot hand, a smack with a shingle on his behind so he couldn't sit down for a year, or the white hand, a sack of flour rub -a scrub dubbed into his hair and sifted down his neck so it itched forever, or the black hand, a mouthful of fireplace soot that darkened his spit for life. He might be forced to jump from the roof balustrade, wallop his head on the marble floor, or be dragged down the stairs by his feet. The only boys bold enough to join were Taffy Sailor, Walker Slats, Bromley, Look, and Q, oh yes, and the president too. So Quentin Roosevelt, nicknamed Q by his friends, was the youngest of Theodore Roosevelt's six lively children. 
Quentin filled the White House with a group of boys who became known as the White House Gang. And the president, an honorary member, often joined the gang in pillow fights and other rough and tumble games. All right, next up for today is Woodrow Wilson. Quote, the world must be safe from democracy. Nickname, schoolmaster in politics. And fun fact, the first president to ever earn a PhD. And that was in political science from John Hopkins University. And Wilson served as president from 1913 to 1921, and this poem is called Bad Sheep. President Wilson wished to keep on the lawn of the White House his own flock of sheep. He believed his new pets would mow all the grass, but that's not exactly what came to pass. You wouldn't be getting it wrong if you said that they cropped and gobbled the shrubs instead. Bushes for breakfast and hedges for lunch there weren't any limits to what they would munch. Though President Wilson achieved his fond wish, he ended up feeling a tiny bit sheepish. Woodrow Wilson's sheep grazed on the south lawn of the White House during World War I. Leader of the flock, Old Ike, was famous for chewing tobacco, and the wool from Wilson's sheep sold at a special auction raised more than $50,000 for the Red Cross. Next up is Warren G. Harding, Quote, America's present need is not heroics, but healing, not normalcy, not revolution, but restoration. His nickname was Wobbly Warren, and fun fact, he was the first president to broadcast over the radio. And Warren G. Harding served as president from 1921 to 1923, and this poem is called, Would You Repeat That? Always an admirer of alliteration, Harding hardly ever halted his habit of haranguing crowds by constantly copying compatible consonants. This pretentious passion for pompous palaver produced a superfluity of sonorous syllables sounding spectacular, except that nobody ever knew what he was saying. So tall and handsome, with a mesmerizing voice, Warren G. Harding drew crowds to his public appearances even though his speeches were often incomprehensible. H.L. Meckham, a famous newspaper columnist at the time, said Harding's oratory reminded him of a string of wet sponges. Next up, we have Calvin Coolidge. Quote, the chief of business of American people is business. His nickname was Silent Cal, and fun fact, he was the first president to be sworn in by another president, and that was by William Howard Taft. And Coolidge served as president from 1923 to 1929, and this poem is called A Penny for Your Thoughts. President Coolidge was quiet. Conversation with him was a solo, never a duet. And then one evening at dinner, the lady sat beside him and said, you have to talk to me. And Coolidge chewed his bread. Leaning closer, the lady insisted, I've made a bet with some of my friends that I could get more than two words out of you. The president didn't think twice. His reply was highly concise. You lose. Though Calvin Coolidge's refusal to engage in small talk won him the nickname Silent Cow, he actually did more public speaking than most presidents, holding 520 press conferences and giving more speeches than any of his predecessors. Okay, next up for today is Dwight D. Eisenhower. Quote, what counts is not necessarily the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. His nickname was Ike, and fun fact, he was the first president of all 50 states. And do you know what the last state to enter the Union was? It was Hawaii on August 25th, 1959. And Eisenhower served as president from 1953 to 1961, and this poem is called Liking Ike. Though Eisenhower's name was Dwight, he used for his slogan his nickname, Ike. Finding this choice a perfect delight, people shouted in chorus, we like Ike. Dwight never acknowledged his terrible plight. He and five brothers were nicknamed alike. Dwight hadn't applied for a copyright. So I have a question, and I hope it's polite. How did the voters know which one to like? Ike, 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 or Ike? So Dwight D. Eisenhower was the third of seven brothers, one of whom died in infancy. His surviving brothers, Arthur, Edgar, Roy, Earl, and Milton, were all known at one point or another as Ike, even though their mother, Ida, disapproved of the nickname. In high school, Dwight was sometimes differentiated by being called Ugly Ike. OK, 
Okay, and lastly for today, John F. Kennedy. Quote, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Nickname, JFK. And fun fact, first president to win a Pulitzer Prize. In what? A Pulitzer Prize for biography. For his work, Profiles in Courage, which is a series of short biographies describing acts of bravery and integrity of eight U.S. senators during the antebellum war era who tried to delay the war going against the beliefs of their own political party. And Kennedy served as president from 1961 to 1963, and this poem is called Elevator Operator. Tourists thought Congressman John Kennedy was the elevator boy, and they asked him for the fourth floor. He was surprised, but those folks had one thing right, he was going so John F. Kennedy was once also mistaken for a page by a fellow congressman, and he contributed to his boyish appearance by dressing casually, sometimes wearing khaki pants or sneakers. Though Kennedy, at 43, was the youngest president ever elected, he wasn't the youngest man to ever serve as president. Theodore Roosevelt, who became president when William McKinley was assassinated, was 42 at the time. So thank you again for tuning in. If you're interested in this or any of the other books that we've been reading to you, you can email us at programs at easthamptonhistory.org and we can let you know where you can find your own copy. So join me in June for a new series, Influential Women of the East End. I'll be telling you stories of five different women and their impact on East Hampton. Stay tuned to our Facebook and Instagram pages to find out when and to learn more about the other programs that we have going on at this time. And I'll see you soon, East Hampton.